Brilliant. So this evening, we are going to talk about, oh, we're not even look at, task six on the exam, which, to be honest, it is task six, but it probably wouldn't be the one I do, do last, uh, because as you can see here, out of the written tasks, uh, which are two, three, where's my pen gone? Two, three, four, and six, students do a lot better on it. So I would spend more time on this than perhaps some of the other ones. Uh, but that being said, be very militant of your time. How many minutes per mark should you be spending? You need to know this exactly. It's 1.8. So three hour exam, 180 minutes, and there are 100 mark available. You need to be very militant of your time because if you don't get onto level two, uh, sorry, task two, the odds of passing are slim because there's only six tasks. Uh, now, you don't need to get 100% on task two, but you want to get the easy marks. So when you've run out of time on a task, move on. As I said the other night, you're either writing far more than you need and you've already got all the marks, or you're writing something, then you're struggling and there'd be easy marks elsewhere. Now, hopefully, if you've got time elsewhere, you can come back to it. But if you run out of the allotted time on that task, move on. Now, hopefully, I, if it was me, I would do task one, and task five first, the automatically mark stuff. And then you would have time to um, spend more time on the written stuff. But just be wary of your time. So as of all the written tasks, it's the ones students do well with. So let's go and see what students do well on and not so well. So you can see that it brings in statements, budget and decision control, um, but Basically, it is going to be a SWOT analysis or a cost-benefit analysis. Cost-benefit analysis might be a financial cost-benefit analysis or a non-financial cost-benefit analysis, or it might be a combination of the both. SWOT might be a full SWOT, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, or it might be focusing on strengths and weaknesses, or it might be focusing on opportunities and threats. Where, because... Tonight, we're going to do a cost-benefit analysis. So just before we go, let's talk about SWOT. What should strengths and weaknesses be? Amy was first name is right. Internal. Strengths and weaknesses have to be internal. And so by that logic, opportunities and threats have to be external. So for example, if you have a poor credit control policy, that is not a threat to the business. That is a weakness. And if you get asked to do recommendations, what you want to try and do is turn, turn a weakness into a threat. Whereas opportunities and threats are external to the business. So, so if Argent Motors, whatever, if they start looking um, overseas, a threat would be exchange rates. Exchange rates are a great one if they're doing anything overseas because it is external to the business. New competitors, new products to the market that they can't compete with. Anything external is a threat or anything they can do externally that they're not already doing, new market, going overseas, new product is an opportunity. Whereas doing something internally better is either improving a strength or making it a weakness into a strength. So if you improve your internal controls, um, yeah, it, it is a strength. So make sure your strengths and weaknesses are internal things. And some, to be fair, sometimes it's a bit of a grey area. Things like websites, I think are internal, but you might think they're external. So if you're not sure, and whatever it says, say ask for three strengths. Normally it just asks for one strength, one weakness, one opportunity and a threat. If you've got a couple of ideas, make sure they're the most internal strengths and weaknesses you've got, and most external opportunities and threats uh, you've got. Yeah, something like something outside in the market, a competitor. So you've suddenly got a whole load of customers you can then market to that you've never had access to before is an is a opportunity. But for example, going from paying your staff in cash to backs is not an opportunity. That is a strength. So I say it's it's going to be a swap or it's going to be a cost benefit analysis, which compared to 
Monday night seems so long ago, which was task four, which can be in all manner of different things. Target costing, standard costing, uh, that kind of thing. Whereas this, it will be a swap or it will be a cost benefit analysis. So like I say, they tend to do um, well on this compared to the others, but what they do do is they do well with a cost benefit analysis or a swap because you know that's going to be in there. And then maybe do a non-financial cost benefit analysis because it, it is going to be one of those three things. What they don't do well is recommendations. And so that is, for example, turning a weakness into a strength, reducing the risk of a threat, or looking at opportunities and thinking, are these feasible or not? Because if it's something that they physically can't do, it's not the best opportunity in the world. Uh, identif identification of non-relevant costs. We talked about this on Monday, and we're going to talk about it again tonight. What is a non-relevant cost? Just whilst we get, I'll, yep, a sunk cost is a non-relevant cost, which is something you've already spent. And for the purposes of this evening, I will repeat uh, what we talked about on Monday, is basically what we're doing in this task, if you get a cost-bearing analysis, we are deciding, shall we do this project or shall we not? And what you will do is look for relevant costs. So if we do this project, what extra benefits will we get compared to what extra costs will we incur? So going back to Deborah mentioned it and Megan mentioned it, a sunk cost. So say, for example, we were looking to do um, electric scooters, we talked about that Monday. If you've already done the research and development, and now you think, shall we do this or not? That's not a relevant cost because you've already spent it. Whether you do this decision or you don't do that decision, it makes no difference. That money's already spent. Whereas Michael's made a very good point is, say you had a spare place in your factory or you've already recruited a production manager who's going to uh, join you. That cost is going to be incurred whether you make that decision or whether you don't make the decision. So it's irrelevant to that decision. Yes, Olivia absolutely nailed it with that decision. It is future incremental cash flows. If it's one of them, it's got, well, inflow and outflow. Uh, but it's, if it, as long as it meets that criteria, it is a relevant cost. If it doesn't meet that criteria, it's not a relevant cost. Now, Han had a very good question, which is there. Um, so a non-financial cost benefit analysis is where you can't put a tangible figure on it. So say, for example, we launched a new product and it is going to sell a thousand products at a hundred pound a piece. That is a real financial benefit. But if it improves customer satisfaction, customer relationships, that's a benefit to the business, but how much is that worth? Likewise, you might sell a product that is really, really cheap. It's going to sell lots, but say, for example, you're a premium provider of whatever you do, and suddenly you come into the market with something dirt cheap, not very good quality, but it's really, really cheap. You might sell lots, but what damage does that do to your reputation? Very hard to put a figure on that. So that would be a non-financial cost. So it's the non-financial cost benefit analysis is just sensible considerations, and we're going to do some down the line, as to what would be something that we would be worse off at, but we can't put a figure on it, time being one. Um, uh, where the other benefits is if it frees up management to do something else you can't say well this will get this and it'll bring in that and save us that it's just another benefit without putting a tangible figure to it and we're going to do that later on to be honest but say we or thinking they cool so let's have a look at this task so this is mark one task six so normally when i say to these questions the first thing i would do 
is look at the question before you read the scenario to make sure you know what you're doing. So you're not reading the scenario and then going, oh, it wants us to do whatever, and then go look for those points within the scenario. But to be honest, as soon as you see financial cost benefit analysis, you know what you're doing. So what we're doing is working through these points. They're all here for a reason. Work through these points and decide where they go or not in a cost benefit analysis. So let's work our way through the top. So what we're trying to do, and this will come in later on, for the non-financial stuff, is make sure you understand it's not just numbers, it's what are they trying to achieve? And then if they achieve that, what will be the benefits of that and what will be the potential costs or considerations of that? So just get your mind working. So we're looking to how we can streamline the month end cycle by integrating a number of standalone systems and reducing the number of manual processes. So this is page 295 in your PDSY mock bank if you're a first intuition student, but you should have automatically been sent a link to download this when you registered on the revision sessions. So if you're not first intuition, you should have this. So before we go further, that's what we do. We're looking to streamline our month end process by bringing a whole load of manual separate systems together into one integrated thing. And basically, we've got lots of points. We need to work them through them in order. It doesn't make any difference. Um, you can put them in any other order, by the way, but you've got to work. You've got to look at every single point. And say, for example, you had an irrelevant cost. I would like to, if possible, say, I know it's an irrelevant cost. Not, oh, I've just missed it. So make the examiner know that you know that it's irrelevant, not I've just missed it. So we've spoken to a number of software developers and we spent a thousand pounds of our time finding a suitable company. We have already selected a provider called Software Innovations and the provider was a, a quote. So we're now deciding to, if we can do it, how are we gonna do it? Shall we do it or shall we not? That part, as Justina and Karen have already said, that is a sunk cost. Say we decide that uh, we're not going to do it. We're not going to get a thousand pounds back. It's gone. And likewise, if if we do do it, then we'll go. Oh, you're proceeding with it. Here's your thousand pounds back. That thousand pounds is gone, whether we do it or not. So that time of a thousand pounds, that's just irrelevant. Remember, you'll get drop down boxes. You know. It's that. So that is there. And I like to put that in like, I know it's irrelevant. So we've got to quote and we're deciding if we do this or if we're not. So if we take the quote up, giving it away, it allows for three software developers spending seven days each at £400 per day. So if we take this up, it's going to be Three people spending seven days a week times by £400 per day, which gives us a figure of, someone's going to probably beat me to it, uh, three times seven times 400, £8,400. So this is a relevant cost because it's in the quote. If we don't do this, we don't take up the quote, we're not going to incur this cost. So it is a relevant cost. Um, the next bit is, if we do this, we will need to buy a piece of bolt-on software for £2,800. Are we going to include that, yes or no? Yeah, the answer to that is, is yes, because if we don't do this, we wouldn't buy the software. So if we don't do this, we don't incur that. So this is a future incremental cash flow. So the answer is yes, that is going in. Uh, next one we've got, we need to spend some time testing the software. It's going to take out side of normal working hours. So it resulted £900 of overtime. This is for people we already employ. Is this relevant? Bear in mind, we already employ these people. 
You're not falling for it. Um, yeah. So whilst we employ these people, it is overtime. So we wouldn't include. We wouldn't normally pay them this overtime. Now, if they're doing it in their normal time and there was no incremental cost to this, we wouldn't include it. But as everyone sort of says, it is overtime. So if we didn't do this, we wouldn't be paying them overtime. So that is a relevant cost. And then last one, last cost, staff training. What do we think to this? Bear in mind, we've already had three relevant costs in a, in a row. Can't catch anyone out. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't train people on software that we haven't purchased, would we? It would be madness. Uh, so we would only train them once we purchased this piece of software. So that is a relevant cost. So we're going to add up our total costs. And what I do want to see is total costs, total benefits, and then it'll give us the net. Because the whole point of this is the net. And generally with AAT, if it's a positive, you probably want to do it. If it's a negative, you probably don't want to do it. But there may be some other non-financial considerations to take into account in other uh, in the later part of the question. But at the moment, we've got 8,400 plus 2,800 plus 900 plus 1,200. It was 13,330. No, 13,300. Cool. So we've dealt with our costs. Now, we are looking at benefits now. So the month end cycle requires Vinod. Billy and Katrina to work 15 hours of overtime each at double pay per month. Their normal rate is £16 per hour. Is this relevant to us or not? Again, these are people we already play, uh, pay. Yeah, and as you say, this is overtime. So if this disappears and it's all streamlined, we, we would save this money. So we would save, how many people is it? Three people uh, times by 15 each. And it's at their double rate times by £16 an hour times by two. So if we streamline the month-end cycle and we don't do this, so this would save us some money. So we three times 15 times 16 times two. Big of that. And don't forget, we're doing it for year one. So times by 12 months. 17,280. Next one, Alison and Chris, they also work extra hours around month end, but they're not entitled to overtime. What are we going to do with them? Yeah, we're going to do nothing with them because then, you know, it's not like it saves us any money. We weren't incurring any extra. So that will be our total benefits. So 17000 280 minus the 13,300 gives a net benefit of 3,980 pounds. What do everyone think to that? Do you think you'd be able to spot all the irrelevant costs and benefits? Yeah, you've got to make sure. So it's spending £7 each at a cost of £400 per day. Yeah, the financial ones, I don't think are that bad. Yeah, just right, it is for year one of the pro year one of the proposal. And we've got 12 months in a year. I mean, to be honest, if you miss the 12 months for a year, you're going to do really well. You know, it, again, no one ever gets 100% in PDSY. We've had people get 100% budgeting, decision control, 
quite a, quite a few got 100% financial statements, which is amazing. No one has ever got 100% in um, PDSY. You just want to pass it. Yeah, and if you wanted to show it is a cost, um, you'd put it as a negative. Yeah, and actually, very really good point, Han. So this is for year one. Without giving the game away, we're going to talk about additional benefits, which might be relevant. Very good point. Yeah, no, cost-benefit analysis will be for a set period. It will be for set period. Sometimes it's over three years, sometimes it's one year. Um, there'll always be like recurring savings or recurring costs. So they have to put a finite um, deadline to it, which will bring us into the next part of the question without giving too much away. Cool. So the next bit in here is the other side is are there any other non-financial and it is factors that should be considered as part of the cost benefit analysis. So we've got five marks. I would say we want five well-explained points. Yeah, so Hand is come up with a great one. Uh, first one, not for happier staff. Where's my H gone? Now, take it further, who are going to be the happier staff? Yeah, which uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Who were the weather? Alison and Chris. Specifically, Alison and Chris will be happier. Because they are doing less work for the same pay. And like the other three, which I can't remember the name, they will be losing overtime, which to be honest, they've probably become accustomed to it. Because like, as we all know, no matter how much you earn, you live within your means and suddenly they've got part of their income um, lost. Um, so they're going to be disappointed, I would think. I mean, to be honest, if they were really annoyed about doing this over time, they'd probably have left by now. So, yeah, so I would split them into two different points. Right. Yeah. Sonia, I think that is a great point. So the actual integration of it. So that might bring in um, like extra sort of disruption, maybe. Or I mean, that might lead to low staff morale. Um, will it be? Will, will it lead to customers being upset? So you don't need to know this, but it's a reasonable, sensible suggestion that, and it's only, remember, considered. It doesn't have to be, yes, this will definitely happen if we do this. It needs to be something that we would consider. And then you might actually think that, you know, the three staff aren't that bothered about losing their overtime because they're just, whilst they're the money, they don't want to do it. But it is something to consider. Jenny. Resistance, I think that's a very good point, but can we take it further? Who, what might, how or why might we get resistance? Yeah, staff inherently don't like change. And what else might be they concerned of? So if you suddenly got rid of, all, yes, Exactly. So if you suddenly got rid of all that extra work that you're paying overtime for, you go one step further, you get rid of all the work you're paying someone's normal salary for. So that might lead to fear of redundancy. Again, might not, but it is a considerate. And then as a manager, you might think, there's no way we're doing anything further, making them redundant. But 
there might be a case of just consider what the staff feel, irrespective of whether there might be a consideration of do we need to make further redundancies. It's a case of what will the staff think. So other than the first point, the next three are quite negative. Um, any, well, yeah, Liz, <laughs> you beat me to it. You might get better information, less errors. It's not always negative. So because remember, it is factors, not non-financial costs or non-financial benefits. So if it says factors, we want a nice balanced answer. If it's costs, it must be costs. I marked a internal accounting controls mock the other day. I was asking for benefits. And I was like, that is a cost. And while it's a very valid cost, I can't give you the mark. You know, lesser errors, better info. Who else might benefit from a better system? Yeah, happier customers. Now, I've never worked in management accounting, um, and I hear all these horror stories about month end, uh, whereas I was just working in a practice, and we did things like 12 months after the event. But month end is quite stressful. But if it's a very slick process, and you're getting your invoices out on time, or whatever the month end in, um process involves you might get happier customers i mean one of the month-end processes and we like it doesn't say here what the month-end process is but one of them might be paying people so if you pay them on time every time the right amount customers are going to be happy yeah i mean it, it, it just depends on you didn't say and like just say if you don't work in management accounting, and obviously this is very much geared at a management accounting function, you're working inside a business, not working for our financial accountants and you're preparing people's accounts and things like that, don't think you're at a disadvantage. You don't need to know what month end is. And someone like, oh, I do month end and, you know, Megan's place, it's not that bad. Other places, it's really, really bad. It, it depends on the industry, it depends on the company, it depends on what role you do. So you don't need to have a vast in-depth knowledge of whatever this is uh, you just need to come up with some sensible potentially relevant suggestions yeah quicker decision making quicker information yeah then uh, we've got way more than our five here uh obviously nice sentences but um yeah, yeah and like jenny says if something's going wrong you could act quicker you know it, it's just I would say a better system, but there are other things, you know, one, two, and three, you may need to consider. And whilst you might consider it, and it might be quite a valid point, you know, when you when we look at change management, which is in business awareness at level three, which obviously none of you will study, we look at how do you implement change? Do you, you know, have a change manager? Do you bring in, you know, pilots things or testing it? You know, there's lots of different ways to manage change, but just because people might, it be resistant to it doesn't mean to say you can't deal with it in a reasonable and sensible fashion cool so that that is that task done to death do you all think you could get five sensible considerations as regards that yeah it's um yeah basically want to say this is the consideration and why well will we need to consider it so you would want to string it better, better together than this. Um, lose, don't put just losing the overtime. You would say, you know, those three people will be losing overtime. This is consideration because they might want that overtime and then they will affect their morale. Um, I would say you want five really nice, well-explained sentences. So um, let's do the set this one up here. So Alice and Chris will probably be happier because they're no, now no longer working hours over and above their contracted hours that they're not getting paid for. Put that down. I think it's a nice point. Uh, resistance. I would say, you know, staff might be resistant to change because they may fear for redundancies because with automation uh, being brought in, they may fear that their jobs may be automated and they lose their job. I think that's a nice, well-explained explained point. I'd give you a mark for that. Quicker decisions on its own, not a very good answer. You know, you want to say why it is a consideration and you know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. 
But what we don't want is a massive essay on one point because we are looking for emphasis on factors. We don't want one really well explained factor because you're going to get, I would say, one point. Yeah, exactly, Sonia. So I would definitely go down the route of if it's five marks, we're looking for five factors. You know, you can't talk forever about the fact that Alison and Chris will be happier. You're like, yeah, I've made that point. Move on. Cool. So last task is recommend whether or not the proposed investment should be made. What do we think? Yes or no? Now, the answer to this is irrelevant. You can put yes, you can put no. But what we are looking for is for you to justify it. So if you write yes, you will get no marks. Why is it yes, in your opinion? Now, if you write no and you can come up with a good justifiable reason, then it's fine. Yeah, I mean, in effect, you can get away with, yes, as Carla says there, the benefits outweigh the costs. That would be enough to ju justify why your answer is yes. But that's not just it. So we've, we've got two marks. We are going to be wanting more than just the benefits outweigh the cost. What else might be something to bring in and we mentioned this a while back at the start of the question as to what else is a potential reason as to justify this yep yep you're all you are definitely down the line but why yep the benefits will continue into the future what will not Yeah, I can write future. Hang on. Exactly. So our cost benefit analysis was based on things like training, buying the software, the software developers. There's going to be no initial, uh, there are none of those initial costs. So actually, the benefit in year two will be greater. Now, I would say that's enough for two marks. But whilst we're here, what else should we bear in mind? Yeah, I agree. It meets the future of business, but how and why? Now, over time, we reduced. I think it's a great point, but I would say that, and payroll, I would say that is sort of in within that point. I would sort of say you're almost making that point again because we've taken into account with that with regards to financial savings and the financial costs. Yeah, mistakes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a few components there, like Karen, we want. Yeah, the other one is non financial benefits so always try and look for something other than just the we're getting this in it's going out there's also be some other reasons why you might or might not want to do it now if you could justify that the non-financial costs vastly outweigh the financial benefits you could get where we're saying no the answer is now typically in these questions it's not ambiguous it's going to be very clear that if you have your head screwed on right, you would definitely do it. Um, if, or if you got your head screwed on right, you definitely wouldn't do it. But it's not that open to interpretation. But yeah, you've got better con internal controls, customers happy. There's always some non-financial considerations to bring in within the decision. Don't just focus on the net benefit or net cost. There are always other points that you can bring in. But for two marks, you don't want to be writing any more than that.
you will not get any extra. There's only two mics available. It is what it is. Move on. So what do you think to task six in general? Of the written ones, I quite like it. Task three, students, for some reason, don't do all that well. But I think task three is quite boring in terms of it's find some weaknesses and it's just explain why they are a weakness. And if it says, and obviously if it says a weakness in a certain system, make sure it relates to that system. And if it says weakness uh, recommendations, make sure you do recommendations. If it doesn't, doesn't. This one, I think, of, out of task two and task four is definitely the more achievable. Because like the examiner says, it's going to be a cost-benefit analysis or a SWOT analysis. And as long as you, you know the internal and external things regards to strength and weaknesses and opportunities and threats, our cost-benefit analysis, watch out for relevant or irrelevant costs. You should do all right. Now, you might make an odd error in, in regards to it. We're not looking for that net benefit to be perfect. So, for example... If you do a mock and that figure's wrong, don't think, oh, I've got it all wrong. No, you can go, yep, 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 yep. I mean, you'll get marks for not including stuff as well. Uh, that and then, oh, we went wrong on that. You're going to get do really well. Cool. Any questions specifically on that task before I stop sharing my screen? It varies, really. It depends on the question. Uh, yeah. One thing I would say, and we're gonna, I am going to come back to your question, Lucy, about the order of the units, is when you get a, a SWOT analysis, you go, you're going to get a bit of a intro here, some stuff in the task. It is given to you for a reason, and it is there for you to use. So. There'll be, you'll be able to, you, well, you won't be able to do this. You can't write on your exam, but you'll be able to run down and go strength, weakness, strength, weakness, and they will be there in the scenario. Not, not pre-release, but in this scenario here. The opportunities and threats, and sometimes they are there, but most often not, they are not there and you need to come up with something. It will be external to the business and external to the scenario, whereas the strengths and weaknesses are very clear. But as long as you can justify it and, you know, things, you know, if your mind goes a bit blank, interest rates are outside of people's control. Inflation are outside of people's control. If you see anything about overseas stuff, whether it's buying or selling or new markets or whatever, exchange rates are a threat. The opportunities are something you're going to have to come up with. Um. Not really, in terms of irrelevant and relevant costs. It's basically if if it's if it needs to be in, stick it in, and watch out. There will there is no way you're going to get a cost benefit analysis, a financial one at that, where there is no irrelevant costs, um, because yeah, you know, this is almost one of the whole points. Of the question is, do you know what is irrelevant and what is irrelevant costs? Just watch out for them. But other than that. Stick the right things in, make sure you got the right figures and don't put the wrong things in. Simple as that. Um, right, I'm going to come back to um, whose question was it? Lucy's question. Lucy's question. In terms of how, what order of doing the tasks? Now, like I said before, you have to. Do all six tasks. If you miss a task out, you are in a bad way. Because let's be honest, no one gets full marks on task two. Um, um, you know, on task two, three, four, and six, the odds are you're probably not going to get every single part of that task right. You need to be good enough. Now, in terms of order, I would do task one first because literally it is the first thing you see. It is one that you do students do really well on. You can only just bang through because it's automatically marked. You know, the true, false, tick the box, drag and drop bang through, get that done. You'll probably get that un done under time. Then move, I'd skip straight to task five, which is ratios. You know ratios are going to be in there. You know you're going to have to calculate ratios. You know you're going to have to get some multiple choice questions explaining ratios, which you shouldn't find anything there is unexpected. I would do that. Then, if it was me, I would move on to task six, because it 
you are literally there with task five. Uh, do that because I think students do well on that. I would then move on to task three. I would then skip forward to task four, and then I would leave task two to the end. That being said, there is nothing wrong with starting from task one and working through to task six. But I think as we've seen tonight, task six is relatively manageable. So you want to be making sure you've got enough time on it. So if you're good at managing your time, that's fine. But I would definitely say you want to be spending, you know, if you're short of time, time on task six will get you more marks than time on task two. Ideally, you have the right amount of time. But that's how I would do it. Task one, task five, task six, task three, task four, task two. Is it? Right. Exchange rates. Um, you do not need to know anything about economics. You don't have a degree in economics. But basically, if they do anything overseas, put it down as a threat. You don't need to explain it in any way in detail. But if the strength of the pound goes up, you can buy stuff overseas for cheaper. Or basically, you can buy more for your money. If the strength of the pound goes down, anything you import from overseas uh, costs you more money. On the flip side, if the strength of the pound goes down, your overseas customers, you suddenly become cheaper to them and you might sell more overseas. But that is probably more than you'll need to know um, about exchange rates. I would just put exchange rates down as a threat. Um, is it worth looking through the reference material and you start spend weeks? Is the answer to that is no, because what they don't want to happen is you go through the reference material, find some strengths and weaknesses, and literally you just remember it. Or not that I'm suggesting you do this, Liz. Someone else goes through all the reference material, comes up loads of strengths and weaknesses. You literally learn someone else's work. You go into the exam and it goes, "What's the strengths and weaknesses in the reference material?" And you just churn them out. It will never, ever be that. It will be something like this. You'll get some sort of intro on the strengths and weaknesses or whatever it is will be based on that to stop people memorizing work and then just regurgitate it. The exam is not a test of your memory. It is a test of can you take some information, analyze it, act on it and make recommendations. So I would read the scenario at least once and then i probably wouldn't look at it again the scenario even aft said it unofficially you don't really need to know it you do, obviously you need to know that they sell electric cars that would save you a couple of minutes in the exam reading it but um it's just not worth doing any sort of analysis on the scenario likewise calculating any sort of ratios on the scenario on the scenario is irrelevant there's no way they're going to go Calculate the gross profit margin on a figure that you've had for weeks at home, at college, with your mates, and tell me what it is. Because there's no way that, you know, it's an Ofsted regulated qualification. There's no way that's going to happen. So it's going to be some figures that they give you in the exam. So you've only ever seen them in exam conditions. Do not spend ages analysing pre -release. It is not a great use of your time. Murray, in terms of how you do a non-financial cost-benefit analysis, it's pretty much like this one here. Now, it might be non-financial costs. It might be non-financial benefits. So only do costs or only do benefits if it asks for it. It's probably going to be a bit of a mixture. But what you can't do is do a, a net figure on this because you can't net off customer satisfaction versus disgruntled staff. But it will just ask for considerations. Only if you've got financial one will it be the net cost, net benefit. Um, mandatory government legislation. Um, you could argue it could be an opportunity. So say, for example, they brought in funding for electric vehicles. If you do a certain thing, that could be an opportunity. Likewise, it could be a threat. Suddenly they, the government say, right, we're going to double minimum wage and your costs go up. Um, you know, you've got to be able to justify it. But yeah, it, it, government legislation is external to the business, but whether you argue that's uh, an opportunity or threat, it, you could argue either way. So if you've only got a little bit of time left, what I would do, if you're a first intuition student, do Mach 1, Mach 2, Mach 3, Mach 4, because they are based on the real scenario. For whatever reason, no one else bases their mocks on the real scenario. Bonkers. Now, the AT sum assessments are not based on the real scenario. 
Um, if you've got lots of times left, it's not going to do any, any harm. But if you've only got time to do two mocks, why wouldn't you do them on the one that's based on the real scenario you're going to get in the real exam? Now, there is no way you're going to get a question and tasks in your exam about streamlining the month-end process. It's not going to happen. But it is based on the scenario, on the real scenario. So why not? And just aside, if you're not a first intuition student, you can get two mock exams based on the real scenario for 15 quid. Cannot say fairer than that. Uh, other questions we got. Literally, with a reference material, read it, read it once, and just go on to something else. Your time is far better spent practicing exam standard questions than reading that scenario. It is not a question a, a test of your memory. Read it once, so you are. You know, I did have a student saying, "Should I read it?" And I was like, "Well, why wouldn't you?" But basically, all you need to know is what do they do, what's the background. You know, you've got the director who's moved away, is trying to retire. You know, it's not the sort of thing I would spend ages to do that. And in terms of supply you with the balance sheet, etc., um, it's to get a feel for the business. So, is it profitable? Is it not? Has it got big cash reserves? Has it not? Is it strong? Has it got lots of PPE? Has it not? That's about it. You will not get any analysis questions on the financial statements in the scenario. It just is is literally background information and anything that is relevant to the question. I don't know, I don't know why I should stop sharing. Will be in the scenario given to you at the start of each task. Uh, yeah, my uh, when I say guide to the synoptic is basically what comes up at what task. Um, did go out the recording the other day. So it's a very good point, actually. Don't learn stuff you don't need to know. So it sounds really scary. You need to know budget and decision control financial statements. You don't. You need to know bits from it. So group accounting will never, ever, ever be in synoptic. Don't look at that. Financial statements is looked at in the, in the synoptic. It's such a small, it's almost like a tick box affair. It's ratios. But then you've got ratios in budget and decision control anyway. If you've only got a finite amount of time to revise one, uh, unit, it would be decision and control. Decision control has you know, more to it. And as you can imagine, decisions and controls really leads into this question, uh, whereas group accounting literally doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I'd say a flashy structure, but again, I wouldn't, you're not going to get loads of questions on that because it's you know, it's 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 not a specific thing where you've got weaknesses and controls that are not working very well and things like that. It's not the sort of thing to get examined. Um, our live classes for PDSY have finished the last ever live classes, uh, but we do have. Well, this will be going on YouTube. In fact, people in months to time will be listening to me babbling on on YouTube. Um, we do have pre-record. We do have recordings of previous revision sessions which are not based on the current scenario but the principles are the same so the, the previous one on horizon hot tubs is obviously about hot tubs um now it won't be on hot tubs unless AT make a glaring error they did do that the other year they forgot to update the scenario in the exam it did happen um but the principles about it you know SWAT is still a SWAT you know relevant cost is still relevant If you've got what we now March, if you pass PDSY, that gives you April, May, June, July, August, September, six months to do three units. It's possible. Just bear in mind, you've got the risk of if you sit in September, you will not get your results before the end of September to have another go at then you'll have to move over. <laughs> yeah, I know nothing about the vehicle trade industry either. Um, you don't need to. Like, the last one was about hot tubs. I can't imagine anything worse than getting in a warm cesspit of water with my neighbours at 2 a.m. It's awful. I have never been in a hot tub. I will never go in a hot tub. I've heard them describing terms I will not mention as what goes on in a hot tub, potentially. 
you don't need to know about it. It is not a test of your knowledge about the industry by any means. It needs to be sensible. Now, I don't think it is a big stretch for you to be aware that the electric vehicle industry is relatively new compared to Carl Benz who invented petrol engine 100 years ago. It's relatively new. It's fast paced kind of thing. I think that would be deemed to be relatively common sense. But I don't know. I've never had an electric car. I don't, you know, I'd love a Tesla, but I'm not spending 60 grand on one um, kind of thing. So don't worry about that. It, it, you, the controls and everything that they need to analyze will be rel pretty much relevant to whatever industry it is. But, you know, it's a good idea to have uh, that. Um, someone's asked me a question directly, which I think is quite interesting, actually. Someone's moving abroad, shall we say. Um, and it's a chance to sit exams remotely. Now, currently, you can't sit this exam. You can't sit any level four exams remotely. But if you move over onto Q22, from the 1st of October, you can sit Q22 exams remotely anywhere in the world. Well, that's what they said. Uh, links to the mocks. I can get them. Um, I'll bring them up in a second. Any other questions? Yeah, hot tubs just gross. <laughs> cool all right let me bring that mock-up thing anyone for anything else other than my opinion about hot tubs it's just mean um yeah so between now and whenever the exam day is basically what you want to be doing is spending as much time as possible doing exam standard questions um it, and if, if possible, if you've got a tutor, get feedback on them because we tend to get some two sorts of students. One that goes, oh, I filled the box. That's 20 marks. And then another one that goes, oh, my answers aren't the same as the answers. Therefore, it's all wrong. And that's not how it works. You know, if you've got someone who can mark it somewhat objectively and goes, it's sensible, it's reasonable, it's possible, it's a real, you know, sensible consideration in the cost benefit analysis, non-financial one. Yeah, they've got to give you the marks. If it's not answering the question and you've written something, oh, that's really, really good, but it's not the question asked, you don't get the marks. It's how it is. Cool. That's quite a good question, Karen. Advantages of acquiring a petrol company? Potentially, but again, you won't need to know anything technical about petrol engines or anything like that. Basically, I would say something like that. You are hedging your bets. You are, you know, obviously it would be a declining. Again, I would think anyone with a bit of common sense would know that petrol engines do not have a finite life. So I would say whilst it's good in the short term, long term, electric's where it's at. Cool. And also it might, just going off, I like that as a good point, actually. It might damage, you see, this is a non-financial cost. If you buy a petrol company, whatever, and start selling polluting diesel cars, the customers who buy your electric cars are like, I don't want to support that company. You know, I, I want to buy electric cars to save the, the world. So that would be a non potentially non-financial cost is damages your um, um, reputation. Now, it probably won't happen, but again... You won't do anything technical, but you something like that, I would think, is relatively um, like common sense. Like we had one about restaurants two years ago, and it's like, yeah, we're focusing on vegan restaurants. My wife's vegetarian, um, kind of thing. And like, you know, people who are generally vegan or vegetarian are relatively more health conscious than people who have all day breakfast. Um, and you know, you sort of come up with some sensible points. Um, no, this will be, this is literally the last revision session ever for PDSY. Um, we're getting loads and loads of students move over onto Q22. Um, kind of thing. And it just nicely follows on from our live class. And so it will be the last one. But obviously, it will be on YouTube. I was going to say forever, but we will be deleting them by the end of September. Yeah, Sonia, if you've got, if you rely on a single supplier or customer, that's a weakness. Um, I would say because 
it's something you do internally. Not sourcing more suppliers is is, is something internally because you're doing it wrong. Cool. Anyone for anything else before we say goodbye to the last ever PDSY revision session ever? Which I'll be sad to see. I like I like teaching it, not so much marketing it, should we say. Cool. I will see you all at some various Facebook live um, webinar, open day or something down the line. Cool. Right. As I say, good luck. Do your mocks. Just do your mocks. I know it's not much fun doing a three-hour mock, but, you know, you wouldn't think, oh, I'll sign up for London Marathon, run a few 5Ks and go, oh, I'll do it properly on the real day because that's not how the world works. So do a three-hour mock. I know it's not much fun, but you will not regret it when you pass. Cool. Good night, everyone. I'll see you later.